Welcome back once again, everyone. We'll battle Christine one more day. Don't know how many more of these I've got left in me. I'm kind of getting ready for a break again, but we'll take another bite. So the goal of today's episode is making a plan. I'm going to have to mock up all of the live power stuff in here so that we can decide how we want to do the thrust washer back here. We can decide how we need to set up the gear mesh, both to the cam gear as well as the belt pulley. And we may not get much further than that, but some decisions have to be made as to how we're going to proceed and what type of a setup we're going to use. So it's, don't expect much more than that. I'm just saying anything else might be a bonus. Let's get busy. So last episode, we covered the clutch side of this in great detail, but we did not get much into the shell and the gears. So this is the prototype one right here, and you can tell it's all handmade, all right, the way they did this. So the shell portion, this round part right here, you can tell they formed that by hand, and they cut all the notches in it. They welded it all the way around on the outside. They welded it all the way around on the inside, and that's actually a pretty nice looking weld. And then you can see where they, they had to have trued this inside in a lathe because they, they cut down into the weld right there and it's just so finely finished. The outside is a different story. And it's interesting, we can see all of these angled scratches in it and they go all the way around. And at first I didn't pay much attention to them because this was just such a rough unit anyhow, but they're so consistent. And then I started putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. What clued me into what I believe happened was this um, this gouge mark right here on the, uh, it would be kind of the bottom forward portion of that belt pulley drive. I believe that mark and those marks were caused by an axle bearing failure back here at one time. It would have been this one right here and that would have allowed the bull gear to drop and also move back. So the flat, parts of the teeth would have been what milled into the bottom of that belt drive and the corners of the teeth coming up and around would have been what put those kind of arced scratches all the way around in this clutch drum. So just another instance of the, uh, the really hard life that poor old X231 had in its past. Obviously though, the only part of the prototype shell that was not handmade is the gears and they're fully hardened all the way through to the hub out here and the way they put this together so they cut all the notches into the back of the shell so that the straight cut gear portion could pass through and the top was threaded so they, they put this big nut on tightened it down and then they put a bead of weld on two sides of it so that locked this whole thing together so you'd have to cut those welds to get it back apart it would be quite the job Compare that with the production piece. Now we have no 10x numbers etched anywhere on this. I know it's prototype though. First thing we notice about the production shell, it's one solid cast piece. We have a 10A7112 in there, but the gears are very easily removed. They're only held in by this snap ring right here. So you peel that ring out, the gears slide right out the back, very easy to disassemble. And it's got those same very thin wall bushings on the inside. Of course, they are smaller in diameter than any of the prototype stuff, but these bushings did not hold up well in the prototype application. You can see they just they just drift right in and out of that hub, and that hub is so hard, there's nowhere in that at all, but they've collapsed because they don't want to slide onto the shaft anymore. So that's not a surprise considering how many hours the shell was being pounded upon by that loose bull gear and the fact that the clutch portion had blown up at least twice by all the former brace marks on it. No surprise that this system failed as horribly as it did. You all will have to excuse senior scraping ice right outside the door. So now that we know all the differences between the two shells, we can begin with the uh, repair. So as I outlined last time, I'm going to move away from these very thin wall bushings and I'm going to use a thicker wall bushing that is going to be a good press fit into the hub. But to make up the difference and get these to fit the shaft, I'm going to have to turn some material down off of this portion of the shaft right here. So 
This is a 1.3 diameter and it bumps up to a 1.5. Compare that with the production shaft. It bumps to 1.3 here and stays that diameter all the way. So we will probably go down to the 1.3 that this step is right here. Carry it on, I'm thinking just until the key slot right there. I don't want to cut into that. We could create a weak spot. But before I do anything that I can't undo, I need to mock all of these pieces up into the back end of the tractor. We just want to be measured in our approach and not paint ourselves into a corner that we then have to figure a way out of. So let's just get all this stuff loosely assembled. We will try to set some gear mesh so that we know exactly where the hub and the shell will be on the shaft. And I'll have a much better plan than moving forward as to where I want to make those cuts and remove that material. So. Let's do it. In the last episode, a couple of viewers asked if Minneapolis Molines were just this much more complicated in their construction than the other tractors, or if this was normal for the time. And this is very much normal for this point in time. This is 1955, and things like live power, things like power steering, things like a three-point implement lift, um, live hydraulics, high low range transmissions. Okay, all of these things were becoming standard equipment. So across the line, everybody was starting to do more and more complicated setups just like this. Um, it's just part of progress. The more options you add to tractors as standard features, the more complex their construction becomes. It's all connected. So. This wasn't just Minneapolis Moline, this was everybody by this point. But all of these features were pretty much, um, well, being developed for the first time with X231 right here because the prior model ZB tractor, which X231 is heavily based upon, did not have really any of this live power stuff, no power steering, no three-point lift, you know, no high-low range amplitorque. All this was pretty much being developed for the first time with this tractor. All these pieces are a real trick to get lined up and put together in here, but there's no one real good way to do it. Get that keyway exposed up ahead of everything so we can get the key put in place. There we go. Hub is on the key. Now I roll it around so that I can get the set screw right there aligned with the pocket. Before I start that nut on the front, I want to be able to see if this uh, if this moves forward and back. So. There, we've got some positive movement, all right? We know the set screw is down into the pocket, so now we can start the nut on the front. I'm gonna roll it again so that I can see the key slot because we need to align the tab of the fold-over lock with the key, there we are. And we've got the nut covering all the threads. 
That's good. I think what I'm going to do for now, let's get back to that set screw. I'm going to bump that whole hub ahead so we have a good starting point with the nut, even with the threads. All right. That's, um, I just like to do things like that. So. Line the spider in with the links now. And again, this is just a temporary pinning because all this has to come back apart again. Very tight working in here. Don't have a lot of extra room for loose parts flying around. That's why when the, uh, the ears broke off of that spider the last time, everything pretty much flew apart in short order after that because you're into the you're into both of the bull gears on each side immediately. Now we locate it at the back with the bearing sleeve and the bearings. I'm putting the fold over lock in just for stack height and secure it with the nut. And of course once we put the cross lever with the forks in place it will pull on that yoke and it will over center that clutch. Disengaged engaged so now <coughs> magnet strung now we'll do a spin yep. pto shaft moves all is well so far let's get that belt pulley put back in place all right dance the gears together spins out there that's what it's supposed to do Okay, the gear mesh is looking pretty good back there, but remember, we don't have any bushings in this shell. So this is the horseshoes and hand grenades approach, all right? We're just shooting for close. That's, that's what we're going to need, but I'm going to move this hub ahead. So we'll back the nut off at the front a little bit, cinch that set screw, which pushes that hub up to the nut. Yep, that's tight. It helps to engage that clutch again to center everything and we look back here. Gears are lining up well and it's going to be hard to see on camera but if we sight down to the cam gear down below we look at the standoff it has off of the back of the drum and that pretty closely lines up with the witness marks from the prior mesh on the teeth. So I think we've pretty much determined the neighborhood where that hub is going to want to be. Got good backlash on the belt drive. Okay. Now we take it all back apart. <laughs> belt drive opening though we can get a look at where that gear from the shell wants to be and we're rather close to the bearing bore in there but I can see some shaft exposed that's just about where I wanted it we didn't want to be tight up against that uh, the bearing housing that's good
All right, everything's back on the bench. And I'll mock the shell back up here just to show you all what I was able to see and not catch on camera. So when I had the shell positioned onto the shaft, the face of it was just above the shoulder that's on the edge of the step right there. So we know we're going to take that step out and we also know we are safe to cut it all the way up to probably just a bit behind that key seat. So that's what we're dealing with. But I think I've completely changed my entire plan. So I don't know that I'll be going with these two bushings on the inside. Not these in particular, all right? Because, well, we still have some issues with what should be a thrust washer back here. Now there's a witness mark from an old one that was obliterated, long gone, you know, through all the failures. By the time we took it apart, that was no longer in place. And the way the production ones are set up, all right, you've got standard dimpled thrust washer, goes against the face on the back of the gear, but a production case has a nice flat area at the front of that bearing bore, boom, where that thrust washer would ride. The problem we have with this repaired case is when they did the job, and this is not a complaint, they did excellent work back here. Um, they saved this whole piece. We could not have done that, but they did not follow our instructions to the letter. They even though we told them we were going to do all the machining ourselves, they had cut in quite a ways at the front of that bearing bore, and we had planned on them leaving all of this flat, all right, because you need a nice wide face for a thrust washer to go up in there. And all that had been cut away by the time we got the repaired case. So the best we could do was flatten out a decent spot for a thrust washer in there, save what was uh, left of the, uh, the bearing sleeve bore, but that leaves us with not a lot of surface for a thrust washer to go between the gear and the front of that opening. So enter this sketch. Just popped into my head yesterday while I was plowing snow and I had to jot it down in the truck quickly before my brain was distracted by another shiny object and flitted onto something else forever. So we have a cross section of what's going on and this is not to scale, this is just representative, all right? So the whole center piece is the shaft. See the threads out here and the, you know, right there where the bearing goes. Uh, this piece and this piece, that is a cross section of the gear back here. This wedge and that wedge are the bearing, primarily the inner race right there. And it just hit me, instead of putting a bushing here, and then a bushing there, and then a third thrust washer out here that would transition between the face of the gear and the opening of that bearing bore. We would have three pieces, each doing relatively one job. Why can't we turn those three pieces into one piece that does three jobs, all right? So we have and again, this is not to scale, this is just an idea. This is a solid one piece bushing that flanges up at the front of the gear face right here. And it thrusts against the back of the bearing race right there. We are eliminating that really narrow band surface that we have in the case. And we're going up against that bearing. I figure it's about equal either way we do it because Neither way has a really good thrust surface, but considering how this bearing is going to be locked in place with the sleeve that is going to have the dowel in it, this is taking all the in thrust of the whole shaft anyway. With this shell and these gears only having to spin the belt pulley and the PTO shaft to show that they work, never carry a load, this is not going to generate a ton of thrust anyway. The backside of the hub down here goes up against that right there. So that prevents the shell from going forward. We just need a little bit of in thrust to prevent it from going back. This sleeve can handle all of that. Of course, we are not going to have a floating washer back there anymore because this is going to be a one piece steel. It's going to be pressed into here and flange up. So that's going to rotate with the gear. So the gear is not actually turning on anything. It's only going to be all special washer against that bearing race. 
I've got that big old slug of bearing grade bronze, plenty long to make it a one piece if necessary. And then I can even maybe cut a couple of oil channel reliefs on the inside um, with this great big block out here. Maybe we can do a couple divots with a feed hole that leads into there so we can catch anything that is for oil that is coming down, trough it in. I can also put some channel grooves on the inside that could be spiraled much like these productions so that as this is spinning, it's going to want to pull more oil in front and back. I think we have a workable system right here. I think that's a much more efficient way to do it being a parade queen, just non-working tractor unit. I think that's gonna hold up just fine and do everything this has to do. Well, I kind of hate to cut and run on you all right here, but as I said going into it, this was probably going to be the whole episode just trying to develop a plan. That is a $100 chunk of bronze, so as soon as I start whittling on that, I'm committed. Although, I like the idea of a single piece setup like that that keeps everything contained between the shell and the bearing rather than trying to bridge the transition between the shell and a less than desirable case profile. Let me know what you all think. Honestly, I want your opinion. I am going to start machining on the shaft first because that may give me a few extra hours to maybe develop an even better plan still. I think, I think that's going to work though and I think a one piece setup is going to be better than a three piece setup. Let me know what you all think. And I wanted to include just kind of a lot of this you know, brainstorming, just thought process into this episode because this is pretty much what goes on behind the scenes in just about every X231 episode that's put together. It's why I say it's a lot more enjoyable to be on the outside looking in watching the process than it is to be the one that's trying to figure the process out. Um, it gets awfully taxing after a while. Every, every turn just gives you another problem. Um, there are no freebies. So now you all kind of know you know, what goes on behind the scenes with all of this. So we'll call it an episode. Let me know what y'all think. If you have a better idea for a better setup, I am all ears. I am open to hearing it. Thank you for watching everyone. I'm gonna get busy on that shaft and we will see what develops. Hope to see y'all back again.